Donna Yeager coordinates customer support here at Hewlett Packard. And as you can see, Donna is a person with a physical disability. She was born without arms. But thanks to extraordinary talent and perseverance, she's been able to overcome much of that disability on her own. As you can see, she operates the standard HP computer. But for many other people with disabilities, that is just not possible. And so it's necessary to find technology that can help the user adapt to the demands of the computer or to adapt the computer to the special needs of the user. Today, we'll take a look at both those aspects as we focus on computers and the disabled on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Datastorm Technologies, setting the standard in PC communications through the development of award-winning software such as Procom Plus, combining power, ease of use, and affordability to become the best-selling communication software in the world. And by PC Connection and Mac Connection, mail-order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh. And by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me this week is Dr. Gary Moulton, Manager of Disability Resources with Apple Computer. Gary, what we have here is something called the Smart Keyboard from Unicorn Technologies. It just won first prize as the most innovative piece of new technology for people with disabilities. Show us how the Smart Keyboard works. Well, the keyboard contains everything that the regular keyboard and mouse uh, would enable a, a computer uh -huh. user to do. Um, I can move the cursor, for example. Mm -hmm. I can enter text. And basically, I have larger targets, so a person with a head pointer or a mouse stick or a hand uh -huh. stick can use the keyboard, this right. keyboard, much easier than they can and use And what are these keyboard. other overlays here, Gary? Well, that's where the smarts of the keyboard comes in. On the back of each one of these, these overlays, there's a little strip yeah. that tells the keyboard what mm -hmm. overlay it has in. So if you were to put this one in, for example, it knows what's right. in it. It knows it's getting a, a keyboard that has larger spaces in mm -hmm. it and different keys. And what kind of user would use something like that uh, overlay? A, a person that would uh, again be using a hand stick or a head stick or a mouth uh, pointer yeah. or just need a, a few keys to mm -hmm. operate the standard software. And this software. we should point out is interfacing with standard software. Mm -hmm. This is just Microsoft Works. It can run with a normal keyboard and, and I can see from this overlay it can run with an IBM PC also. Mm -hmm. Gary, you're an expert in this field of special education. In general, how important, in fact, has computer technology been to assisting people with disabilities? It's been very important because the technology that's currently available for computers uh, levels the playing field yeah. for individuals with disabilities so they can do the same mm -hmm. thing that mm -hmm. anyone else can with a computer, yeah. to learn, to work, to think, and to sure. play. Well, with the recent enactment by Congress of the New Americans with Disabilities Act, there certainly is renewed interest in technology that can help people with disabilities. We're going to start out by visiting one resource center in Berkeley, California, where their special interest is children with disabilities. This is the Disabled Children's Computer Group. It's an organization started by the parents of children with disabilities in the hope that computer technology can help their children lead normal and productive lives. The point of the technology is that it can help people do things they could never do before. They can learn in a way that's appropriate for them. They can play. They can go to work. But our approach is that they get the tools that they need, um, that they become empowered to know what's right for them, and that they have to learn what is right for them. Nobody can tell them. My boy. UC Berkeley student David Clark is using Dragon Dictate, a voice input system which lets him communicate with his personal computer despite his severe physical disabilities. Dragon Dictate is a speaker adaptive voice recognition system with a vocabulary of up to 25,000 words. Lisa Wall says that people with disabilities are benefiting from the general interest in voice input as a user-friendly interface for all computer users. They're trying to make computers friendlier for everybody, and that's going to make the biggest difference for some people with disabilities. Uh, we see people who are temporarily disabled with carpal tunnel syndrome from too much typing, and if they could use their voice for a while and give their hands a break, and then people with physical disabilities who could talk, and people with learning disabilities where spelling is a big problem. If they could talk to their computer, 
uh, they would be able to work faster and more easily and without having to worry about the intermediary device of a keyboard or uh, hardware. It is the problem of those intermediary input devices that the people here are trying to solve so that disabled users can have the same access to computers as everyone else. The solutions are taking the form of talking software, speech synthesizers, touch-sensitive screens and other special adaptive devices. It is the hope of the parents who founded the Disabled Children's Computer Group that the technology they discover will improve the ability of all children to communicate and interact with each other. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. Windows, icons, GUIs, and mice are all terrific if you can use your eyes and your hands. But for people with disabilities, the advent of a graphic user environment simply created new obstacles for use. That is, until these folks came along. Here to show us the latest technology for the disabled is Mark Sutton of Berkeley Systems and Paul Aquit of Don Johnston Development Equipment Incorporated. Paula, you have some uh, input devices here that are designed for use by the disabled. Just show us what these are and what they're meant for. Okay. This blue board is similar to the one that you've seen previously. Yeah. And it's used with people who have cerebral palsy who can use their fist to access the keys. Or perhaps it's positioned down on the floor to be used with your foot. Uh-huh. Okay. And this one? This multicolored small mini keyboard is used for people with muscular dystrophy. They have fine motor movement but don't have the full range to cover the entire uh -huh. keyboard. Okay, and what else do you have there? I brought along several switches, and they're used, uh, people use those who have single controlled muscle movement. So mm -hmm. even if you can position this under your chin or at head level or on a lap tray on your wheelchair. Uh -huh. There's even a specialized switch that if you have an eyebrow wrinkle, you can use your Macintosh computer. Just by wrinkling the muscle, you can operate the That's computer. That's correct. Okay, we're going to go back and take a look at Connects in just a second. Mark, I want to turn to you, and you have something called Outspoken, which is loaded up here in the software. Before we get to that, I want to ask you, uh, about the graphical user environment of the Mac. It would seem that's a nightmare for someone who has a visual impairment. I is that true? Well, actually, the graphical computing environment is a conceptual environment, and so a visually impaired person can take advantage of those just as anybody else would. Mm -hmm. um, for example, your files are listed right there, and I can just go to a file. Um, I'm going to go find a folder and uh, find a file within this folder. And let's see, outspoken. Outspoken. Right here. And go right into it. And so those files were already listed, and I could have gone a lot slower and yeah. taken some <laughs> shortcuts there. But basically, <laughs> the idea was that I could find those and open them. Yeah. All right, now you're using something called Outspoken. Tell us, first of all, what is Outspoken? That was already up and running when you started, and that's what enabled you to do what you just did. What is Outspoken? It's a piece of software, so you don't need any hardware that you can install in your Macintosh. And it'll basically make it talk, and it'll allow you to navigate around the screen um, if you cannot see the screen or if you cannot use the mouse. And um, so it doesn't require any additional hardware, any speaker, or anything. All right, now you're, you're not using a mouse, because that would obviously be a problem, but how are you moving the cursor around? I'm using the keypad. And uh, there's various keys on this keypad that allow me to move around. And for example, I can even slow down the speed. OK, so just to make it clear, I mean, you were able to understand everything Outspoken was saying to you. We probably can understand it, because we're not as tuned into that, correct? So you're kind of slowing it down for us, so we can figure out what's going on. You get used to the language after yeah. a while. OK, now we're, and also, we're just in standard software here, right? This is Microsoft Word. There's nothing special about the software. It's just Outspoken is providing an interface to Microsoft Word. Right, or anything else that you would want to use. All right, now show us, for example, how you would, you would pull up a file or start to create a document or do an edit, any, any kind of normal word processing function. OK, um, right now, as you saw, I actually opened up a file here. So let's say I want to open up a new file and just mm -hmm. start typing some text. Menu Go up to the menu bar. File. Move to the right to the file menu, menu. and hit the drag key new. and go Shut down to it. new. Now, obviously, I could do command Window. in. There's various other shortcuts, but that kind of um, demonstrates some of the features of the program. Mm -hmm. And I could find out, for example, All showing. what window I'm in. And I could start uh, just typing some text. I once had an elif name 
blue return. All right, now how would you edit that document? You want to change a word or something? Okay, I could go back up to the beginning of the line. I once had an elephant. And I could hit the drag key again. Elephant. And say type in a new word. And then, uh, and then I could read the line. I once had an elevator named Blue. And well, point, New York. I can also find out now. Yeah. Before I deleted that, that was highlighted, and I could have found out that it was actually highlighted. Yeah. Well, one last question. Highlight. You're using Outspoken on the Mac now. Are you also trying to develop this for the Windows environment? We are. We now that we have some experience actually doing this for graphical environments, we're mm. trying to approach the problem of access to other graphical yeah. environments. Mark, that's great, thanks. Paula, let's go back to Connects now. And really, Mark was showing us the problems of a visually impaired user. You're really talking about someone that has motor problems that can't put their fingers on the keyboard or the mouse. And how does Connects address those problems? OK, Connects allows me to use my single switch to access the, the Macintosh computer. I'll bring up a scan array. So as you said, that could be a person who perhaps can only use their chin or, or, or their foot or something. That's correct. And I use my uh, switch to make my selection. The pointer goes up, pulls down my menu, menus, and begins to automatically move to the right. So let's explain what's happening here. What's happening is we're scanning all the possible choices simply by clicking that button. That's correct. And then clicking when you get to the choice that you want to use. Exactly. Okay, go ahead. How we handle dialog boxes is that we know there are buttons in the dialog box. So I'm able to choose an icon that will scan all the buttons in my dialog box. It'll scan all the buttons in the dialog box. I again hit my switch to select. Now I'll make a new file folder. I'll do scan menu bar again. Hit my switch to select. The pointer will begin to scan. It'll bring up a new folder. Now I need to title that new folder. So I'll select the icon that gives me a text macro. It'll type it in for me. Hmm. Now that I have a folder for important papers, I'm able to throw my old papers into the trash can. And once again, you're just picking the function you want to use as it scans past all the options. That's correct. It'll go, button down, select that folder, and bring it over to the trash for me. Mm -hmm. What's amazing is really how quickly you can do this. You know, someone was, was watching this thing, well, that's great, you have to wait. You don't, I mean, you're, you're moving very quickly. In fact, that's as correct. Mark was moving very, very, probably more quickly than, than, than I could have done it. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. We want people to be competitive and, and yeah. to use their computer in real time. Give me an idea, both of you, uh, how expensive it is to do these kinds of things. Mark, how, how costly is it to get outspoken on your Macintosh for someone who needs it? It costs $395, and the package includes manuals in different forms, tape, ca um, cassette tape, braille, and on disk and in print. Oh, that's great. And how about for Connects, Paula? Connects is $780. Hmm. And you get the, the box. This is sort of a hardware-software combination. That's I correct. And then the person's able to uh, select what alternate input device they would like and add that yeah. to their system. All right, thank you both very much. They're very impressive products that I'm sure help solve uh, a lot of problems. Most of the technology for the disabled is focused on physical disabilities. But at Drexel University in Philadelphia, a professor of neuropsychology has developed software for the mentally impaired. Prosthesis wear is software designed to take care of the routine tasks of living. Easy for most people, but difficult for those with impaired mental abilities. The software acts as a brain prosthesis an artificial brain, if you will, allowing people with mental disabilities to manage their personal and home environments with the click of a mouse. Drexel University students Scott Quillen and Bob Westall worked on prosthesis wear with neuropsychologist Dr. Doug Shute. Dr. Shute says computers have not been very successful in retraining patients with brain injuries, so his aim is to use computers to help those who are permanently disabled. Computers, quite frankly, aren't really very good teachers. They're certainly not very good therapists. Um, and so we decided to try and change it around, do something a little different. Instead of having the computer be the, the tutor, we decided we'd use the computer as a tool, and, and in this sense, as a prosthetic aid. Speechwear is the first actual prosthesis wear product. It runs under HyperCard and usually requires third-party hardware to enable a person with physical disabilities to use it. Some users have full control of hands or fingers, but others have only the use of one muscle. 
Dr. Shute says while prosthesis wear can't take the place of the brain of a disabled person, it can certainly help that person function. The computer isn't somehow replacing memory or replacing speech, um, but rather what it's doing is it's, it's functioning as, a, as an augmentation. Um, the same as if somebody loses a, a limb, they lose a hand. Um, it may be replaced by a hook. It's not the real thing. Um, it is still nonetheless useful and functional for them. And, for the and Computer and Chronicles, the I'm Maria Gabriel. We've seen some impressive technology solutions thus far for people with disabilities, but if you're blind, how do you deal with colors, for example? And if you've suffered a sensory injury, how can computers help you regain your abilities? Here with answers are Walt Naraki of IBM and BT Kimbrough of Enabling Technologies. BT, I want to begin with you, and we've seen some pretty exotic laptop and notebook computers on this show before, but never anything quite like this, Eureka A4. You've got two of them in front of you. Uh, first of all, there's obviously no screen at all on this computer, and I suppose that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, it's designed to, to be as efficient as it can possibly be for a blind person. Uh -huh. That person doesn't need a screen, so it isn't here. It's all designed around speech. Many blind people can enter in Braille notation, and Braille only has six dots, so mm -hmm. we only have to have six keys, which means that the keyboard area here is cut down quite a bit. What are the other keys then on the keyboard? These are function keys. These uh -huh. get you in and out of the various programs. This is, in a way, to the IBM aficionado, sort of like desk made in a box. Uh -huh. uh, it has the same kind of memory resident programs you would expect from Deskmate, there's really no connection yeah. with that commercial right, product, right. but it's got the word processor and it's got a little database here and a phone directory. Could you show us how you would actually use that to do, say, word processing? Yes, or, or um, what we've got here, um, incidentally, the voice you're going to hear is an Australian voice because this pro product was designed and developed in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're at the very beginning of a text that we put in here and let's let it read that. So we had pre-edited a text in there. This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Right. If we want to add a little bit um, to that, we get to the end of the text here and we had So you're entering text in Braille notation, correct? That's right, Stuart, and I'm using contractions. There are shorthand uh -huh. uh, sort of contractions in Braille yeah. that make it possible uh, to write a little faster, and that's one of the reasons that the Braille mm -hmm. isn't any bulkier yeah. than it is. I guess one of the unique things about the Eureka is with all the other problems you're trying to solve and using this very little machine, it also has music capabilities, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Matter of fact, um, not only can um, it allow you to uh, enter music and print it out, and a lot of us would like to go back to music school, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't, and do that without having to hire a copyist, yeah. but it can actually allow the user to learn to write basic programs. Bye. And we have here, every time we get out of a program, it says bye because it wants you to know that you're back in the main menu. Uh -huh. We have here uh, the basic interpreter, which will actually show um, a user uh, how you set up a program to do something like sing happy birthday to somebody. Huh. Now let's run that. Okay, now let's not make it do all that talking. Let's skip past all that. We want it to sing happy birthday to your producer, okay. Doris Fox. And now we're just going to enter the last syllable of that message. And now it's all set. And many more. So, <laughs> and you really a, just wrote the program that did that. Is the point? That's right? right. You just programmed that. And we filled in a couple of blanks so that it would sing <laughs> the right syllables. Okay. Can we go over to the other machine? And there's more music capability in there that you have set up on that one, isn't there? This is a much more serious compositional tool. Uh -huh. And um, if you are in need, let's say, in the school of music that you're attending, of actually writing out compositional exercises, and you want to print them. Uh, this machine will actually print them in such a way that sighted musicians um, will think that they look like real music and they'll be able to play them uh -huh, or sing them. Uh -huh. If you're a church organist, yeah. as I was for 20 years, you can do arrangements for your choir. Uh -huh. But you're going to want to check this stuff before you get done, before you print it out. Mm -hmm. And what we're actually doing is going one position at a time through a composition that's here and listening hmm. to each note so that we, if we don't like it, we can actually use the cursor keys to go up here and change the notes. Hmm. But assuming 
that we haven't heard anything wrong and now we want to hear the finished composition to get an idea of wh whether there are any contextual problems you can only find if you hear the whole thing. Right. Voila, we can do that. Not surprising, I guess, one of your customers, I understand, for this is Stevie Wonder, who has a couple of Eurekas. That's true. As a matter of fact, Stevie has given Eurekas to some of his friends, uh -huh. and one of them is Ray Charles. Oh, really? And I hear very often from Ray Charles between Diet Pepsi commercials, <laughs> can we say that here, yeah. um, asking us uh, various questions about how to enter very technical music. Ray wow. is making uh. great demands on this system. Lastly, just a little bit of time left. How about the color sensor part of this? Uh, could you show us that, BT? We're going to bring up a program that actually uh, enables us from a disc to put the sensor on various materials okay, that we... So you've uh, got a box in front of you and it can tell do. what color the box is? It's going to tell me what color the box is. As soon as it tells me that it's up and ready to go. It's ready. All right, it says it's ready. So we're going to put it on here. I'm going to press a function key and it's analyzing the length of the waves. Hmm. It says it's maroon. Uh -huh. Now we ought to slow it down and do it once more because it said maroon pretty fast. Yeah. That's yeah. an Australian accent, sure. you know, and it takes a little catching on to. Quickly, BT, how would you use that as a blind person? Well, I could um, see myself either taking it to the closet or bringing the closet to my table and matching up ties. <laughs> and also, Stuart, if I wanted to put a form in a printer in my office, yeah. and it was very important that I put in the blue form and not the green form, uh, this would solve my problem. That's great. Walt, let's turn to you now. And at IBM, you've developed something called Thinkable, which, as I understand it, is meant to really retrain people who have disabilities because of injuries or something like that. Is that right? Yes, it's focused on people who have had some type of closed head injury, maybe from an automobile mm -hmm. accident or a stroke. And the product is very important right now because in the last 10 years, because of trauma centers being more mm -hmm. effective and all the helicopter delivery, it's much more needed because more of those people are surviving. Uh -huh. And when they survive, Many times they have a closed head injury or brain damage. All right, show us some of the things we can do with Thinkable. Okay. The first one is, is called discrimination, visual discrimination, mm -hmm. and I'll go through it. And uh, Thinkable will actually yeah, give ready. us the instructions. Okay. Look at these two pictures. They are the target. Touch the two pictures that are exactly the same as the target. So this is helping me in my now. visual discrimination. So I'm going right. to use the touch screen. That's a hand. And I'm going to touch the correct That's pictures. The face. Correct. Okay. Okay. Now I want to make a point here, Stuart, yeah. in that you notice we used body parts, an eye. Well, yeah. We use lots of noses because many people wake up after a close head injury and cannot recognize relatives. So we use facial pictures to the things closest extent. to home is the parts right. of your body. Right. Sure. Many of those are celebrities because we couldn't yeah. put everyone's mother or father in there, right, so we right. use people that they may have remembered. All right, what about the memory training part of this, Walt? Okay, well, I'll just go right into that okay. next. Okay. This is going to be short-term memory, which is a common problem with uh, people now recovering. Now you can okay. practice memory. So what do we do here? Get ready. It'll give us the instructions. Okay. It repeats them for the, uh, the client. Look at these six pictures. Remember where each picture is located. Touch the window mm -hmm. to match the three pairs of pictures. Now. So this is a kind of mini concentration game right. to help you exactly. with that short-term memory. I have to remember where they were and uh, select them on the screen. Yeah. Okay, wh what about the problem next of sequential memory? H how does that problem occur nice and how do you yeah. use Thinkable? Sequential memory is being able to remember things in sequence, and I'll just shift the screen into that. But a common way that you might see that is someone who is uh, now just back from the hospital may have to do a task like take the trash out. Yeah. We've all done that, where you gather up right. the trash from the waste baskets and you take it outside of the garage, but you may re not remember what to do next. Yeah. That's a sequential memory problem, and this practice session is aimed at helping right, people us. sharpen that skill. You can practice sequencing. And this will have to will have to remember things in the correct order. In their order, right? right? From one, two, three, and on. And you can use a sequence length up to nine okay. with this program. Watch these pictures. Pay attention to the order in which you see the pictures. Uh, 
I see. So there's those three objects. Now I'm going to have to duplicate that sequence of events, which I have. Touch the pictures yeah. in order from first to last. You notice it uh, changed the positions of them also. Yeah. You are doing well. And again, yeah. a positive reinforcer building Very your impressive ego. stuff. Walt, BT, thank you guys very, very much. That's our program on computers and the disabled. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news on Random Access. In the random access file this week, Compaq is cutting prices on its 386 desktops by as much as 36%. The low-end Desk Pro now has a suggested retail price under $1,100. Microsoft has cut the wholesale price on DOS 5.0 to encourage more upgrades. The discount should mean a new retail price of under $50. IBM has announced two new PS2 models which use the 386 SLC chip. The new CPU has 8 kilobytes of cache memory on the chip, which can improve performance up to 88%. IBM has also announced a new ultra-fast switch chip that doubles the current speed at which data can move from one component to another. IBM says its new switch can transfer all the data from a 60 megabyte hard drive in one-tenth of a second. Macintax is still the top-selling Mac software title of the week. Disk Doubler has moved to number three. Auto Doubler and Kid Picks are both new to the top ten. A company named Aqualine has announced a new 33 megahertz 386 notebook computer that has a 170 megabyte hard drive and 16 megs of RAM. The price is $39.95. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Datastorm Technologies, setting the standard in PC communications through the development of award-winning software such as Procom Plus, Combining power, ease of use, and affordability to become the best-selling communication software in the world. And by PC Connection and Mac Connection, mail-order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh. And by Byte Magazine and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated, plus background information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a subscription to the newsletter, call 1-800-366-9484 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes.